Great to have you guys here today, and I want to thank you for being a part of this series. We've been in a message series called Forgiving What You Can't Forget. Last week we talked about how to forgive someone who's really hurt you. And this week I'm excited about today's message because we're going to learn how to set ourselves free, how, how to forgive ourselves for our past. And so today's message, I'm excited about it. Today's message is called Putting Your Past Behind You. It's a very common issue that people just feel this guilt and this shame that they carry around with them. And God did not intend for you to live in guilt and shame. He wants you to be free of that. So I'm excited about today's message. I got a lot of points. So last week I had 10 points. This week I've got nine. So don't worry, next week my sermon will be pointless. Okay, that's my plan. So... I'm going to even it all out. So anyways, I'm excited about today's message. I'm going to dive right in. You guys ready to go? I'm excited about today. So let's, let's do this, okay? So many times we carry around guilt for things we've done, places we've been, people we've been with, things we've you know, been a part of that we wish we, we regret. We're like, God, I wish that wasn't a part of my life. I wish that wasn't my, my past, my history. And I don't know if your history was 10 minutes ago, 10 days ago, or 10 years ago. Either way, we still oftentimes carry something uh, with us from it. And so I believe that God wants to truly set us free today. So I'm going to dive right in here and I'm going to tell you the first thing we need to do that, about guilt that we all deal with is how we normally handle guilt. Let's just dive right in. What do we usually do with our guilt? Well, the first thing we normally do is we bury it. That's the first thing we typically do with our guilt is we just kind of stuff it down and just ignore it, pretend like it's not there, but it still is there. David said this in Psalm 32. He said, when I refused to confess my sin, I was weak and miserable and I groaned all day long. My strength evaporated like water in the summer heat. Finally, I confessed all my sins to you and stopped trying to hide them. I said to myself, I will confess my rebellion to the Lord and you forgave me. All my guilt is gone. Doesn't that sound nice? And so we can have it all removed, but, but he, was, he was burying it for so long. And finally, he just came to God and said, God, I just can't carry this around any longer. I just have to, have to give this to you. It says in Proverbs 28, you will never succeed in life if you try to hide your sins. So oftentimes we, we try to bury it and pretend like it's not there. The second thing we do is we blame others. You ever try to do this? We blame others. Uh, Adam blamed Eve here in Genesis chapter 3. It says, yes, Adam admitted, but it was the woman you gave me who brought me some. And I ate it. But God says, Adam, did you eat, from the, did you eat some fruit from the wrong tree? Oh, it wasn't me. It was, it was the woman. The woman said, it wasn't me. It was the snake, right? So they're all blaming someone else, right? And so we have a tendency to do that, right? Well, you know, the only reason I'm like this is because of the way I was brought up. My parents, it was just, I had a rough upbringing or I had a boss that was a real jerk or, you know, if you knew who I was married to or you knew what I was dealing with. So we tend to blame other people for our own decisions. It's very common to do that. And I think one of the most popular things we do is we blame God. Isn't that funny how we do that? Uh, we tend to do that. We're like, God, you made me this way. It's your fault, God. You put this desire in me. And so you're the one that I should blame, God. It says in Proverbs 19, people's own foolishness ruined their lives, but in their minds, they blame the Lord. I found this to be true a lot of times. Uh, people will, will blame God for something they've done. And then if they have a sin on repeat, which we typically do, right? We have a sin on repeat. If, if, eventually, if they, they carry so much guilt, so much shame, because they're like, God, forgive me. Oh, Lord, forgive me. They, they always ask God to forgive me. And they go do it again. Oh, God, forgive me. Oh, they go do it again. And it just keeps going. And so eventually, when they figure that they can't change, they just start to say, well, I'm going to blame God. But then it goes from I'm going to blame God. You ever had a friend do this to you? Like, I'm not really sure there is a God. Which, you know, it's just, it's easier just to remove God and then, because if we remove God, then we're not actually sinning. Then it's just who I am. So I think this is where people begin to, you know, quote unquote, deconstruct their faith, which is code word for I have a sin I really like, and I'm just going to pretend like there's no God. And so I think that's a very common thing for people to do too. So we blame others. We blame God. And this is probably the number one thing we do is we beat ourselves up. You ever done that? You just always beat yourself up like, oh, why am I this way? I'm such an idiot. I'm so dumb. I'm so stupid. I can't believe I'm just a terrible person. I, I messed up again. And we just beat ourselves up. Scripture put this, puts it this way. Romans 7. This is what the Apostle Paul said. Keep in mind, this is the Apostle Paul, the guy who wrote half the New Testament. And this is what he said. He said, what a terrible failure I am. Now, if Paul's a failure, I don't even want to know where I'm on that spectrum, right? Like you're the Apostle Paul and you're saying you're a failure. He says, what a terrible failure I am. Who will save me from the sin that brings death to my body. It's right after this that he wrote, therefore there's no condemnation in Christ. He says, but thank God for Jesus, right? After this, he says this Romans 8, 1. Before that, he says, I'm such a terrible person. Another translation says, I'm a wretched person, a wretched man I am. He says, I am a failure. 
This is oftentimes how we feel. You feel like, man, I just can't do anything right. I can't believe I did that again. And we beat ourselves up. Uh, Psalms 38 says this, my guilt has overwhelmed me like a burden too heavy to bear. I am bowed down and brought low all day long. I go about mourning. You ever felt that way? You just, you beat yourself up. So what do you do? This is what we typically do with our guilt. So what does Jesus want us to do with our guilt? Let's get out of this. How many of you guys would like to get out of this, this horrible state that we find ourselves, right? How do we do that? Like, huh, how do I get out of this, right? Here's how you do it. What does Jesus do with our guilt? What want us to do, excuse me, with our guilt? The first thing is this. He wants us to admit it. This is the hardest part. It, we have to admit where we've wronged God. And this is hard. This, one of the reasons why we don't experience true forgiveness is because we don't ever experience true admittance, where we admit what we've done. But that's important. So it says we have to admit it. Proverbs 20 says this, the Lord gave us a mind and a conscience. We cannot hide from ourselves. It's true, isn't it? Emerson once wrote years ago when he came into some money, he began to travel the world. And when he did that, he found himself going to all these ruins. He's every, everywhere you go where there's like something world famous you want to go see, they always call it ruins, you know? <laughs> it goes to Stonehenge, it's someone's ruins, right? And he, he, he wrote one, one time in his journal, he said, I find it funny that I'm going to all these places called ruins, but I wonder if I'm just going to places all around the world trying to escape looking at myself. And then he said this, he said, I feel like I'm ruined looking at ruins. I'm ruins going to look at ruins. I wonder sometimes we want to travel so much and get away because we don't want to have to face ourselves. So that's the way he felt. And he's a pretty successful guy and he felt that way. Again, the Apostle Paul says, I'm a terrible failure. I think it's very common for us to feel that way. So we have to admit it. It says in 1 John 1, 8, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So basically, if you say you're not a sinner, then the lie that you're telling yourself today is your sin. Because we're, we're all sinners, all of us, right? And then it says in Lamentations 3, let us examine our ways and test them. So we have to admit where we have failed God, failed each other, failed ourselves. And then once we do that, Number two, we have to accept responsibility for it. Psalms 51 says, I recognize my faults. I am conscious of my sins. And then in James 5, it says, admit your faults to one another and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Now, this doesn't say go to Facebook and post it. No, 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 it doesn't say that. It, it doesn't, I don't recommend going to Twitter with it. Twitter is a cesspool of shame, by the way. I, I don't recommend that. You're not gonna find a lot of grace there, you know. So I just, I wanna warn you, that's not what we're suggesting. But I will tell you that God forgives you when you go to him. But if you have a sin on repeat, you're probably going to have to confess that to someone else so they can help you break the cycle of that. More on that in a little bit. But, but I want to encourage you that we do have to come to a point of accepting responsibility for our own decisions. And here's where it finally gets good, okay? If you will admit it and accept responsibility for it, number three, ask for forgiveness. Just ask. Just ask God to forgive you. And here's what scripture says. 1 John 1, 9 says this. If we freely admit that we have sinned, we find God utterly reliable. He forgives your sins and makes, makes you thoroughly clean from all that is evil. He completely forgives you. Isn't that great to know? I, oh, come on. You guys get it. I mean, that's an amazing gift. Because on to say this, Romans 3 says, for all have sinned. Yet God declares us not guilty if we trust in Jesus Christ, who in, in mercy freely takes away our sins. It's, it's imagine, just imagine if you went to one of these car dealerships where you buy the car from the dealer and you make your payments at the dealership. And, and, and the problem is you haven't made payments in months, even maybe years, and you owe so much money, they're hounding you. So you have to go get it right. You have to admit what your mistake. You gotta go, you've got a debt you just can't pay. Imagine this amount of money being so much, there's just no way you can pay it. And as you drive up to the dealership, right? You're like, what do you do? Actually, I'm sorry, you didn't drive up. Someone dropped you off. They already got your car. They're about to repossess it, right? So you go up, you're trying to get this right. You walk up and then there's this guy in a white robe with long hair holding the key. And you're like, who are you? He's like, I'm Jesus. What, what, what are you doing? He goes, well, I, I paid off your debt. Here's your keys. And you're like, what? He goes, no, but I owe them. And he goes, here's your keys. And you go, okay, thank you so much. Let me go talk to him and see if I can work out a deal. He's like, why are you trying to work out a deal on something I already paid for? Why are you trying to negotiate with something I completely paid in full? I'm telling you, here's the keys. I covered it. I completely paid your debt. You don't owe anything. I covered what you owed. 
That's what Jesus did for you. The reason you're fully free is because he paid for it. It's covered. We have a problem with this, especially if you're from a, a highly religious family. Yeah, then you understand what I'm talking about because I grew up in a highly religious home. Great qualities about that. Great, great things about that. But the problem is if you've grown up in a high religious environment, it's, it's just, it's too simple. You can't accept it. You're like, no, 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 no. I mean, okay, Jesus, thanks for the keys. I appreciate that. But I'm going to go work out a deal because I'm going to try to be really good so I can earn this car. And he's like, why are you earning what I'm giving you? Why are you trying to pay for what I already paid for? And so, and the reason I know this is because we do this to other people, right? We're like, hold on, you're telling me that that person who parties their brains out, does all kinds of bad stuff, can just ask forgiveness and it's gone? That's what I'm telling you. Because we tend to look at other people and think, oh, they're so horrible, I can't believe you forgive them. But what do you think, you're, what, what, you think we're perfect? You think you have it all together? And by the way, we're the most harshest on people's sins that we've already committed ourselves that we don't want to tell anybody. Isn't it funny how we do that? And so I just want to encourage you that you're forgiven. We have a hard time with this concept, especially, again, if you grew up in a religious home because we feel like, i got to earn it, i got to work hard, i got to prove that I'm good enough for God to love me. It's like, prove to who? Who are you trying to prove that to? And some of you are really bothered by it. It's like, but you're just saying it's okay for them just to do whatever they want. No, the Bible's pretty clear that you, that you need to honor that grace you've been given by now living for God. But what do we do as Christians? We say something like this. We say, well, you know, they probably really aren't even saved. Okay, let me back up. So I've been married a long time. Now, I've never done this, but let's just pretend for a moment that I ran around on my wife, okay, which I've never done, thank God, but let's just say I did that. You wouldn't say, well, he's probably really not married. You'd be like, no, he's married. He's just a really bad example of a husband, but it doesn't mean he's not married because we still think we have to work to earn it. But like, but you no, know, you can have a relationship with Christ and be in relationship with him and still sin and be really foolish and stupid, but still, you're still a Christian, but see, we have an issue with that, don't we? But let's just be honest. We even try to create theology all around this. But the truth is that people, well, they're not really saved because they're not. Well, first of all, when the Holy Spirit is tired of his job, I'll have him call you. But until then, he makes that call, not you. You don't determine that. That's not your decision. That's Christ's decision. And if Christ, if they know Christ, and they may not be walking with Christ in this moment, but maybe they're actually Maybe they're messed up making bad decisions, but could it be that they just don't know how to hide their sins as well as you and I do? See, guys, we all need grace. All of us. All have sinned and fallen short of God's glorious ideals, what it says in Romans 3.23. Right? All of us. But Christ declares us not guilty because he paid the price in full for you and me. And so ask for forgiveness and he will forgive you. So now what does Jesus do with our guilt? How many of you guys are excited to know you're about to be set free? Doesn't that feel great? Like, oh, thank God. Thank God he sent his son so we don't have to pay this whole price. But again, people say, well, that's not fair. That's not right because they're not even living for God. What about my uncle who, who was a sinner his whole life and partied his brains out and ran around on his wife and was horrible father and terrible person and never even paid his bills and then he accepted Christ on his deathbed and he just goes to heaven? Yep. That's a Zachariah. Well, that's not right. It's not fair. Well, you think this is based on fairness? Based on fairness, we all go to hell. This isn't based on fairness, thank God. It's based on favor. And you know why I know that's true? Because there was a guy who did everything I just described and he was someone's uncle and he was hanging on the cross and he turned to Jesus and said, please remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus looked back and said, see you in about an hour. See you later today in heaven. But, but, but he didn't have any fruit. He didn't have time to live for Christ and turn his life around. He didn't get baptized. He didn't do anything. He never went to church. He never paid anyone back. Never, right, and he's in heaven. That's how good God's grace is. You just ask forgiveness and it's done. It's that amazing. It is that good. And if you add anything to it, then let's be honest, what you're actually saying is the cross isn't enough. And I'm not willing to say that. The cross is enough. Amen. So when you say, well, that's just too easy. Well, easy for you, but it wasn't easy for Jesus. Let's not pretend that the cross was easy and clean. It was disgusting and brutal. But yet it was beautiful because he gave his life for us. And so we are forgiven because of what he's done. So what does Jesus do with our guilt? First thing he does, number one, he forgives us. He forgives me instantly and completely. This is mind blowing yet true. Isaiah says this, God is merciful and quick to forgive. 
He completely forgives you. And then look at Colossians chapter two. He has forgiven all your sins. He has utterly wiped out the evidence of broken commandments, which always hung over our heads and has completely annulled it by nailing it to the cross. All the stuff you did is now forgiven. All of it, completely, totally forgiven. It's amazing when you think about that. He truly sets us free. The second thing he does, he forgives me repeatedly and freely. Repeatedly. Some of you are like, man, I keep asking God to forgive me for the same dumb thing. And Jesus says, and I forgive you for the same dumb thing. Again and again. You said, well, okay, again, the highly religious person goes, whoa, 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 whoa. That's not fair. That's not right. For them to ask God to forgive him and then do it again tomorrow. You're right. It's, it's not right. But isn't that why we need Jesus? Because we need someone to help us get right. And so the, the truth is, is that you may have sin on repeat and, and ask God to forgive you again, and he always does. Now, please be, car- be careful here. Paul actually says in another place in Scripture, we don't have time to study today, but he said this. He said, do not go on sinning just because you have grace. So I'm not saying it's right, just like it wouldn't be right for me to run around my wife, but it doesn't mean I'm still not married. I just may be a really bad example of being a husband. Does that make sense? I'm not saying it's not, I'm, we're not saying it's right. I'm not saying it's okay and, and also, let me tell you another thing, too. When you see someone ask God to forgive them and then go out and do the same thing the next day and do it again and again, first of all, there's still worldly consequences that come with that. You can ask God to forgive you for your sin, but you still got someone pregnant. You can ask God to forgive you for your sin, but you still have the scars, the emotional damage that you caused yourself by making those choices. Does that make sense? So, yes, you're forgiven, but there's still real you can ask God to forgive you for a crime, but you know, many people are, have asked God to forgive them and, and they've been freed in Christ, but they're still behind bars, paying the price that they owe man, that they owe the laws, right? But you can still be free with Christ. Don't, don't confuse these two things. And so, but what does this mean? He forgives us repeatedly and freely. It says in Hebrews chapter seven, Christ is always interceding on our behalf. He's always there for us. He's always ready to forgive us. Ephesians one says this, for by the sacrificial death of Christ, we are set free. That is, our sins are forgiven. How great is the grace of God? It's true, isn't it? Oh, like, like that's it? It's that simple? Yes, it is that simple. And when people try to tell me, no, no, I don't agree with that. There's no way, because what about the Bible says this, the Bible says that. You know what? There is no amount of theological education that will make up for, for by grace you've been saved. We're trying to add stuff to it. That's called works. That's called, oh, I got to be really good now. No, you don't have to be really good for salvation. You should want to be good because God loves you and forgave you. Like if, if Jesus gives me a free car that I actually owed all the money on, I'm going to be grateful to him. I'm like, oh, I want to honor you now. This is why Paul said a bond servant. He called himself a bond servant to Christ. He said, I used to be a slave to the world. Now I'm a slave to Christ. But the great thing about being a slave to Christ is he's not so hard on me. He loves me. He blesses me. So you're going to serve one or the other. But I'd much rather serve someone who paid my price in full. And he says, take my yoke upon me, for my burden is easy. The world's burden is heavy. Christ's burden is easy. Make sense? So you've been freely and completely forgiven, totally renewed in Christ. There was a, a, a famous atheist named Marganita Lasky. Uh, before she died, she was interviewed. She was a novelist in the 80s and 90s. And uh, before she passed away, she, one of her last TV interviews, she said this really powerful statement. She said, what I envy most about you Christians is your forgiveness. I have nobody to forgive me. Can I let you know something? If you go do a search on, in the Bible about how to forgive yourself, there are no scriptures on that. Do you know why? Because if you can forgive yourself, that means you're God. But you're not. Because in other words, what God's saying implicitly in all the scripture where he says he forgives you is if I have forgiven you, then it doesn't matter what you think of you. You're forgiven, period. God said it, it's done. You are free. You are forgiven. Your guilt has been removed. So I don't even have to forgive myself. Well, I'm, I'm not saying we don't have to deal with our emotions and have to forgive ourselves, but if God forgave you, then what are you holding on to stuff for? It's removed, it's gone, it's forever. But for you to hold on to it, that's actually a form of works too. You're saying, oh, I don't think it's quite enough, so I'm going to add a little something to it. What? I mean, I guess you can, it's a little maddening for you to keep making payments to the car dealership when someone just said they paid it. Why are you still making payments? What are you doing that for? Why? You're making some kind of guilt payment. And it's like, no, 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 it's been paid for. What are you doing? Move on in your life. Move forward. 
And so we have to learn to move forward in our lives. Look at the scripture says, it says in Psalms 32, what happiness for those whose guilt has been forgiven. What a relief for those who God has cleared their record. So now I want to serve Jesus because I'm free. I don't serve Jesus to get him to love me. I'm, not, I'm going to try to be really good so he'll love me. No, I'm going to want to be really good because I'm grateful, because I'm thankful that you forgave me and I've been set free and I want to live for you because it's just awesome how I get this freedom for nothing. So I don't strive for the victory, I walk in the victory. I don't strive to get the victory, I come from victory because Christ already died for me. It's been paid in full. We have such an issue with this, it's so hard for us to grasp this simple concept. And I believe one of the reasons is because we're caught in a cycle. Can I talk about the cycle real quick? You have to learn now to break the sin, guilt, shame cycle. This is what it looks like. You have sin, you, you commit a sin, then you feel guilty for it. And that guilt, the Bible says, godly sorrow leads to repentance. We should change based on that. Go to God, ask for forgiveness, and then we're renewed. But instead, what do we do? We think, oh, I feel so bad at what I've done. Even if we ask Jesus to forgive us, we don't live in that reality. We, we know he forgives us, but we don't really live that out. We're like, oh, I still feel bad about what I did, and I've got these memories, and what do I do? And so we, we go from guilt to shame. But the problem is, if, if you carry around shame, guess what it makes you do? It makes you go sin again, right? You ever had like a giant tub of ice cream and you just pigged out? You're like, oh, I just feel, oh, I just ate the whole thing. I feel so bad, right? And so you're like, I feel bad and I physically feel horrible and I look horrible and I weigh myself on the scale and I'm like, blah. And so the next day I feel so depressed because I'm so fat and I feel horrible. I think I'm going to go have some Mexican food. And so then, <laughs> so then I pig out. I mean, I've never done this. I've heard people do this. I don't know any. <laughs> I have no personal experience in this, but, and then you feel horrible and you're like, oh, this ate, now I'm not even bigger and I feel horrible and I feel terrible. I'm going to go have a Snickers because I'm so depressed. So what are you doing? You're going from guilt to shame and the shame's doing what? It's actually causing you to go do the same sin again. So you find yourself in the wrong person's bed, made a wrong decision. Um, I can't believe I did that. I, can't, I feel so horrible. I'm such a bad person. I guess that's just who I am. So I might as well go do it again. I feel so bad. I'm just, this is just, I guess this is who I am. So we go do it again. And the cycle continues. How do you break out of this cycle? Maybe it's a substance. Maybe you're like, I keep looking at the wrong things and I feel so bad and I live in this shame. I guess this is who I am. So I'm going to go look at more wrong stuff. I just, I lost my temper again. I just lose it on people. I just, I guess this is why I'm wired. I'm just mad. I'm just so frustrated. God, I can't believe. And so, I feel so horrible. And so when you feel horrible about yourself, you snap at people. The cycle repeats. It just keeps going. How do I get out of this, Pastor? How do I, how do I break free? See, what we're doing is we're, we feel empty from our sin, and then we try to fill our emptiness with more of the world. I know this is over Easter as I was looking at the scripture in Luke chapter 24. The angel said to Mary and the other women who showed up to, to, uh, to, to help with Jesus' body, they walked in thinking they were going to find the corpse of Christ, but he wasn't there. And the angel said something powerful. He said, why are you looking for the living among the dead? And the reason we keep repeating our sin is because we feel so empty. Then we go try to fill our emptiness with more dead things. And then we feel even more empty. And we feel our, try to fill it up with more dead things. And it's a cycle on repeat. You can break free of the cycle, and here's how. You go to Jesus, and you say, I desperately need you. And I want to be filled with life not with death. And so, Holy Spirit, fill me with who you are. Remind me I have grace and I'm forgiven and I'm made new and you freely let me go. You let me off the hook completely. I am free from this sin completely. John Maxwell says something really powerful. I think this is one of the reasons why we need to do this. He says, you cannot perform in a way inconsistent with how you feel about yourself. So if you feel like a loser, you'll keep acting like a loser you're not. Christ says you're his child. So you're a son of God. You're a daughter of the most high. If that's true, then begin to live like that and begin to break that cycle. John 8 says this, then Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, where are your accusers? I love this. This woman's caught in adultery. How many times? Probably the umpteenth time. The reason I knew where she was, they're like, there she goes again into so-and-so's house. We know that's not her husband. So they dragged her out. They're going to stone her right here in this, this it. We're done with you. You know, this woman's probably been around. I mean, the reason they could catch her is probably because they knew who she was and what she was up to. This wasn't something new for her, probably. Jesus shows up and says, whoa, whoa, guys, before you stone her to death, hold up. Just write a couple things down. He reaches down. He begins to write things in the sand. 
What did he wrote? I think it's interesting it doesn't say what he, what he wrote. I think maybe one of the reasons why is because it was private. Because if you want us to know, he, he could have, they could have said what he wrote, but he didn't. I wonder if what he wrote were the names of the times that those men were with that woman. Isn't it funny how critical we are of people that are doing the same sins we've done? So he's writing stuff down. They all drop their rocks. They're like, all right, I'm out. And then he looks at the woman and says, where are your accusers? I, I don't, they're, they're all left. And then Jesus, the Messiah, the one who can accuse, says, neither do I. And then he says something shocking. Your sins are forgiven. Go and sin no more. Okay, well, what else? Where's the contract I got to sign? He's like, that's it. Your sins are forgiven. Go sin no more. Well, do I need to go to the temple? And do I need to say a bunch of Hail Marys? Do I need to, like, give to a certain organization? Do I need to, like, no. No, your sins are forgiven. Go and sin no more. See, guys, we have to base all of our theology on what Jesus said. If you study the Bible, everything else in Scripture comes down to what Jesus said. And Jesus said, I forgive you. Go and sin no more. Nothing's added. That's it. Quit adding to this. You're forgiven. It's all done. Quit carrying around something you were not meant to carry around anymore. And then in John 8, 36, John said this, John the, also called the beloved disciple. Also people argue, and, and I would argue this too as a, as a pastor. I'm not a theologian, but I've studied under theologians. I will tell you, they will tell you that John was arguably the closest emotional connection to Jesus directly of all the, of all the apostles, of all the disciples. And so he said this. He said, if the son sets you free, you're free indeed. Here's what it looks like. What he did is he went, hey, let me tell you something. If the son sets you free, and I bet you look both ways, he's like, seriously, you're totally free. He's like, look, if Jesus sets you free, you're free indeed. It's done. There's nothing else to do. So Jesus hands you the key and you're like, that's, I can just drive off. Like, I don't need to, no tax title license. Oh, you know, hey, that's it. Like, just, he's like, go, get the car, get out of here. I, I did it. I covered it. You're good. Well, what if there's some question? I got it. I got it. Go. Go and send no more. That's it. That's it. That's the beauty of this, is that you are set completely free. Robert the Bruce um, was uh, at one point king of Scotland. They were fighting for their freedom from the English in the 14th century. And they were hot on his trail. They knew if they could just capture him, kill him, that they would be able to still control Scotland. And a very famous story, um, he's on the run. He has his assistant with him. And they're in the forest, they're running for their lives, and they have Robert's bloodhounds. They know his scent. So there's no escaping. These dogs are going to go directly to him. They know his scent. And so they're standing in the forest, or they came upon a river, and his assistant says that, you know, we can hear the, the bloodhounds. They're right on us. And he said, there's no escaping. And Robert turned to him and said, you're right. It's okay. It's okay. Then he jumped in the water. Just to relax a moment, it took him downstream a little bit, but what he didn't realize is when he jumped in, the water completely washed away his scent. It pushed him down the river, and when it did, the bloodhounds came to the edge of the river and stopped, and there was no more scent to follow. Just about a month later, he was made king once again of Scotland. And here's what I want to tell you today. I know Satan's hounds are on you, but if you'll just jump in the river of Jesus' grace... The scent of sin will be gone. But not only are you forgiven, he also crowns you royalty. He says, you're not just a fugitive. You go from being a fugitive on the run from your sins to being totally forgiven. And then I put a crown on your head and call you a son and a daughter of God. That's how far removed you are from your sin. So right now, I want to do something around. I want you to stand to your feet right now across all of our campuses. Those are online. Stand up to your feet right now because I want to declare something over you in the name of Jesus right now. I want you to hear this loud and clear. If the Son sets you free, if you've got Jesus in your heart, you're free indeed. Now, if you don't have Christ, we're about to pray a prayer and you can receive Christ and be totally free. But if you already are a Christian, you're totally set free. So right now, I want to tell you, you're free. Totally. Like completely. There's no side contract. There's no small print. That's it. So quit beating yourself up. My daughter last night had her prom. 
I'm still a little sore about it, but that's okay. I'm going to work through it. <laughs> she looks so beautiful. I mean, she did. I wanted to take some duct tape and cover some parts of the dress up a little bit, but it's... She's beautiful. We adopted her. And she has all rights to our family. Like, whether she knows or not, she already has a full inheritance from me and her mother. All that we have is hers. Now, she thinks it's all hers. We're going to know that. actually splits three ways. I'm sorry, but she thinks it's all going to go just to her. But, but, but she, because she, when we brought her into our family, she's, she's, fully, our, she's fully Cornelius now, 100%. So I need to tell you something. Through Christ, you've been adopted into the family. I mean, why does someone wear a crown in this world? Because they just were born into the right family. They didn't do anything for that. They were just born in. You don't get a crown because you're good enough. You don't earn a crown. You're given it. And today, in the name of Jesus Christ, I declare that his truth is true. And when he says you are forgiven, you are forgiven Indeed, fully and completely. So quit beating yourself up. In the name of Jesus, I release you from your guilt and shame because Jesus releases you. It's not me doing it, it's him doing it. You are totally free from your past. And now, right now, just imagine God is setting a crown on your head saying, you are not just a fugitive, you are set free and you are royalty because you are my son, you are my daughter and you have full rights and authority of the inheritance that comes from being a child of God. In the name of Jesus, I speak that over you. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Just take, take a moment and pray. Can you just thank Jesus for his forgiveness? Maybe today your prayers is to say, God, I fully admit it. I take responsibility for it. And then my favorite part, Lord, is that I know you forgive me. So Lord, forgive me of my sin. I give it to you. And I know today I'm set free. Thank you, God. And now he puts a crown on your head. With your head bowed and your eyes closed, if you've never given your life to Christ, you can receive him right now by praying a very simple prayer. You can just pray this prayer with me and you can walk in freedom after that. Just say, dear Jesus, I realize I need you. I believe you died for my sin. And I believe you rose again. I ask you to come into my heart, be my Lord and be my savior. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. And now I repent of my sins, and I will follow you from this day forward. With your head bowed and your eyes closed, if you just gave your life to Christ, would you just lift your hand high? No one's looking around. Just lift your hand high if you just gave your life to Jesus. Thank you. There are hands going up all across our different churches right now. Praise God. Just hold your hand high. Thank you. We see those hands. Thank you. If you're watching online right now, you can put it in the text chat. Just text my hands raised, or just click hand raised right now. Just let us know. If you just gave your life to Jesus, praise God. You're not alone. Many people are trusting in Christ and being freed forever from the shame and the guilt of their past. Thank you, God, for renewing us every day. Thank you that we are free from the things we've done. Thank you, Jesus. Your cross was enough. It is finished, is what he said. We thank you for that. In your name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Isn't God good? His word is so true. Thank you for watching the Church Unlimited YouTube channel. But don't stop now. Join our online family so you can stay connected with what God is doing here. Subscribe to this channel and hit the bell so that you never miss a service. And don't forget to share with a friend. You can also support the ministry by clicking the Give Now button to help us continue to impact lives around the world. Thank you for watching and God bless.